All right. So today we're talking about what forms do you need for a purchase or sell transaction, right? So I created a new um, purchase transaction here. We're going to start with the purchase. Probably should have started with a listing, but we're going to start with the purchase. By the way, while this is opening, um, somebody had really good advice. They said, uh, I was watching a video this morning and they were like, are you a realtor and you're affected by the NAR you know, lawsuits? And they're like, it's not a problem. Just make your business seller based. I thought that was a good response. Like you don't even have to worry about the buyer broker agreement if you're seller based. So just throwing that out there. All right. So in a purchase transaction, I, well, number one on that NAR uh, lawsuit whole issue, we're going to always start with our buyer representation and broker compensation agreement. So your BRBC form, okay, that's going to allow you to represent the buyer. Keep in mind that with the new lawsuit and the settlement that happened, if you're going to be working with a buyer, showing properties, answering questions for them, operating in a agency relationship for that buyer, you need to have a BRBC signed. We've been preaching this now for a couple of years, um, at least in our office, because I'm a big proponent, always have been of the BRBC. It's an employment contract. I'm not going to go work this for somebody without an employment contract. So you have that BRBC. Along with that form comes the anticipated broker compensation form or your ABCD. That's the acronym ABCD. That's the form that discloses to your buyer the potential compensation that is listed that you might be receiving from a third party. Okay, that's important because in the BRBC, it talks about, hey, when we go to write an offer on a property, I'm going to let you know what the compensation is going to be ahead of time. You can also check a box on the BRBC that says at time of showing so you can decide how to do that. Right now, you could do the ABCD form or you could do a MLS printout that shows that commission. But chances are that MLS printouts no longer going to have the commission on it. So that's not going to be helpful. If you go with the MLS printout to disclose the compensation being offered by the seller or third party, um, just make sure you have them initial it as part of that offer process. So uh, buyer representation, anticipated broker compensation disclosure, ABCD, those two forms. Um, usually it's the BRBC first. Then at time of offer, we're going to have the ABCD form. I usually include the market conditions advisory, either at the time of the BRBC or at time of offer, either one. The market conditions advisory outlines to the buyer the fact that the real estate market is cyclical. There are highs, there are lows, the market changes, and ultimately the buyer's in charge of what the buyer chooses to offer on the property. I can make suggestions and recommendations, but ultimately it's their choice. That's why I include it with every offer, okay? The other form that I like to have my buyers sign up front, either at time of the BRBC or at time of offer, um, Michelle, I'll answer your question in just a minute, is the statewide buyer and seller advisory. This is like 14 pages. The first page or two outlines what kind of uh, relationship you can have with the agent as far as the client goes, whether it's single, you know, representing the buyer, representing the seller, dual agency. Then it talks about the importance of investigation and how it's the buyer's responsibility to investigate the property they're thinking about choosing. Also outlines our duties as far as disclosing any material defects. We learn about the property, that the seller has a responsibility to disclose anything they know about the property, and that the buyer has a responsibility to do their due diligence and also disclose anything they find about the property. And then it goes into like 12 more pages of the different types of investigations a buyer can do on the property. I don't want to give this to the buyer after we're in contract. I like to have it up front. So again, either at time of the BRBC or time of offer. I think this one actually has an address on the top potentially. So if it has an address, it goes with the offer. If it doesn't have an address, I'd put it with the BRBC. They only have to sign it once. So it doesn't matter when. Um, Michelle, to answer your question about when would they sign the BRBC? Anytime uh, before I go show them properties. Okay. Um, for a lot of our Zillow agents, they're having them sign sometimes not ahead of time, but when they show up to see that first property, sometimes they're taking a copy of it with them and having them sign it. So you could do either or, but you want to have that signed before you walk through a property. You can make it. We've talked about the BRBC. In fact, we covered it a couple weeks ago. Um, you can go back and watch that training, but you can make it either like a general BRBC, like, hey, I can rep I'm going to represent you for the next year on any properties in Solano, Sacramento, Yolo, 
Marin, Mendocino, you know, whatever counties you want to outline that you want to go show properties and represent them in that you have knowledge of. Or it could be, hey, you asked me to show you these three properties. This VRBC is property specific for these three properties. So it doesn't have to be like a blanket one. So if it's the first time you're meeting with a client, um, you're unsure of whether you guys are going to be a good match. I still want to get paid if they decide to write an offer on the properties that we're seeing. So I may make it a property specific BRBC. So there's options there. Okay. Um, so statewide buyer and seller advisory. Next is our California residential purchase agreement, right? That's what the form that we actually use to make the offer. So we can't make an offer on a property without an RPA. Okay, with that residential purchase agreement, you have a bunch of additional forms. You have the agency disclosure form. You have the PRBS or the possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. You have the wild, uh, sorry, the wire fraud advisory. <clears throat> There's your agency disclosure. It's catching up with me here, eventually a computer. You have your fair housing discrimination advisory. So remember, we can't take any of these forms off. They're attached to that residential purchase agreement. So they all get included. You've got your PRBS or your possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. You've got your wire fraud and electronic funds transfer advisory. You've got buyers, homeowners, insurance advisory. Okay, that's now attached. You've got your California residential purchase agreement and joint escrow instructions. That's the actual offer form. And then at the end of the offer form, we have, hold on, we're almost there. Dun, 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 dun. The buyer's investigation advisory. And we have the Fair Appraisal Act addendum, saying that we can't discriminate on the appraisal. And then also California Consumer Privacy Act advisory disclosure and notice. So all those forms are actually attached to that residential purchase agreement. You don't have to select them individually. They automatically attach themselves to that. So just keep that in mind that we're also sending those out for signatures at time of offer. Just waiting for it to take me back to my transaction list. As always, while we wait for this to reopen, if you have questions, you can throw them in that chat box, raise your little Zoom hand, unmute yourself. If you're watching this on replay, you can throw it in the comments or just text me directly. If you need, oh, I can't give you my phone number because then YouTube will get mad at us and take our trainings off. So, um, but you can reach out to me on social media if you don't have my direct phone number. All right. So that was the California residential purchase agreement and like the 20 forms that are attached to it. The other thing that I want to make sure my buyers have at time of offer or before would be the wildfire disaster advisory. And that's the one that just says, hey, we live in an area, you're buying a house in an area, I guess not live, you're buying a house in an area where there's potentially wildfires. There's been known to be wildfires. There could be wildfires again. And insurance is important. It's hard to get, make sure that you start looking for insurance early. Um, that is part of the investigation contingency is the insurability of the property. And it's not only that the property is insurable, it's that the premium is also affordable to the buyer. So both of those things fall underneath that wildfire disaster advisory and under the investigation contingency. Um, let's see here. This buyer material issues form, this BMI form, I would include a blank form um, at time that I sat down with them for their buyer presentation or when they signed that buyer uh, representation broker compensation agreement. I would also send this over to them um, separately at time of offer as a PDF form or right after the offer was accepted, buyer material issues. And this just says that, hey, buyer, what are you consider a material issue? And with relation to this property, is there something that concerns you that you would like answers on? Okay, that's the BMI form. It's mentioned in the residential purchase agreement. I believe it's also mentioned in the BRBC. Okay. Um, so in fact, I think maybe it's not mentioned. Well, I think it's mentioned in both, but it's definitely mentioned in the BRBC. I would probably include it with that form. So they have a PDF copy of it from the very beginning. If we're going to negotiate our commission as part of the offer, okay, whatever's being offered is not acceptable or does not meet 
um, or exceed the amount that the buyer signed for in the BRBC, we can negotiate directly with the seller at time of offer using the SPBB form. So that, that's this form here, SPBB form there. Now, um, I skipped over two, no, I skipped over three forms, maybe four. Number one, agent visual inspection disclosure. So those are all the forms that would go out either at time of BRBC or time of offer. So at time of BRBC, I would send out the BRBC and I would send out the market conditions advisory and I would send out the buyer material issues. I wouldn't have them sign the buyer material issues. I just want them to have a copy of it. Okay, so those three forms together with the BRBC. At time of offer, I would send out the residential purchase agreement, the anticipated broker compensation, the statewide buyer and seller advisory, the wildfire disaster advisory, um, the SPBB form, if it applies. And we haven't talked about this one yet. The for your protection, get a home inspection. Technically, this is only required with FHA loans. May also be required with VA. I think it's just FHA though. Um, the for your protection, get a home inspection. But I would send this out with every offer so that the buyer is advised that my recommendation is always to get a home inspection. So that's the HID form for your protection, get a home inspection. After the offer is accepted, the other forms that you will need is your agent visual inspection disclosure, right? We go do our AVID where we do a, a visually diligent inspection of the property. We don't have to open and close things. We don't have to test systems and components. We're just looking for material issues related to that property so that we can report those. Um, the buyer's uh, inspection election or investigation elections. Um, Adriana, I told you the wrong name. I told you it was buyer inspection election. It's actually buyer investigation elections. And I normally send this out via Glide. Okay, on this one, it's really confusing. It's a page with like 72 different types of investigations a buyer can do on the property. It tells them to check the boxes for um, whatever ones they are potentially interested in. It doesn't commit them to having to do those. It just says, hey, here's what I'm kind of interested in. It gives you some talking points to work through as far as what kind of investigations you're going to schedule on the property. Um, so I usually send that one out through Glide. In addition to that one, once they've chosen the inspections, I send out the buyer investigation or inspections waiver. Okay, that one says, hey, here's what we recommended. There's the home and the pest on there. And then there's a blank line that you can add any others that you've recommended. Um, the buyer has chosen not to do these. Okay, so if the buyer has chosen not to do any of the recommended inspections, you would fill it out there, have them initial that they're acknowledging that you recommended it, they chose not to have it. That's your buyer inspection waiver or the BIW. Now keep in mind on most residential properties, we're going to uh, recommend a home inspection a wood destroying organisms inspection or your pest inspection, a roof inspection, an HVAC inspection, and a sewer lateral inspection. Okay, if there's a chimney, we're going to add in a chimney inspection or a fireplace. If there is a pool, I would recommend recommending a pool inspection, right? And then the rest are dependent on the property. What does the property have? What should be inspected or investigated? As we've talked about during our buyer classes a couple, uh, well, it was probably like a month ago now, um, I have a buyer intro email that says, hey, here's the ones that I recommend. Here's what they look for. Here's the approximate cost of those. If there's anything that you have concerns about that's not covered by these, please let me know. I'm sure there's an inspection for that, right? So I'm just like a CYA type statement there that, hey, here's what I recommend. And if there's anything else that you have concerns on, let's look at that, okay? So I always make sure to cover there, but that's the investigation wa waiver. Um, that's all of the regular forms that go out to each and every buyer. Now, obviously, if a buyer wants like some repairs, then we would uh, put in a uh, buyer's request for repairs or repair request. Okay. Um, if the buyer was selling a property, then it might be contingent upon the sale of buyer's property, which would be a COP form. 
Once we remove contingencies, we would use the contingency removal form. There's a cancellation form. There's an extension of time form. So there's lots of other forms that might get involved with your transactions. These are just the blanket. Here's what goes out with the BRBC. Here's what I send out with the residential purchase agreement. And here's the other things that you need to be aware of right at the beginning of the transaction, like within the first couple days, 48 hours. Any questions on a buyer's transaction and the forms that should be included? Fabulous. You can set this up as a template, just so you know as well. We'll be covering that probably in the next two months. I'll go over templates again and how to set them up. But if you've opened up a file, you have all these in here, or you have a buyer file and you have those in there, you can really just come up right here and somehow you can convert this into a um, template of which I'm not seeing the option for right now. So don't ask me how to do that right this minute. Um, I don't think you hit apply template because I think that allows you to pick another one. No. Um, we'll cover that when I, in the next trick. <laughs> Oh, here, we go in the templates, I think. Nope, that's gonna take me out of here, I think. There used to be a really easy button. Now it's gonna bother me and I'm gonna have to find it. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, I just hit the little blue down arrow right here, blue down arrow over here. You can go save as template and you can save it as residential purchase template and then all those forms would be in there. We'll go more in depth on those templates because you can actually pre-fill information on your templates so you don't have to ever type it in again. Um, but we'll talk about that. So anyways, there you go on that one. All right, any questions before we move on to our seller documents? All right, moving on to our seller forms and here's what I would include with the listing agreement or if I got that listing agreement like you should, um, at time of the listing presentation, then this is what I would go back to the office and then send out to that seller for signatures or things that I would send out through Glide. So I'll let you know what I would send out um, directly through here for signatures versus what I would send out using Glide to have the buyer, the sellers fill out. My general rule of thumb for my buyers or my sellers is things go through Glide that have to have things filled out or questions answered because the way Glide presents it to the client is way more user-friendly than it would be presented. Sorry, it's not showing up, which is annoying. It'll show up here in a minute. Um, I may have to close out and reopen for my forms to, to magically populate. Um, <clears throat> so anything that has questions that need answers, go through Glide. To answer your question, Michelle, Glide is a program that we have access to through um, our Barry's membership. So through our MLS membership, we have access to Glide. There's a free version and a paid version. I use the free version. Some agents do pay for Glide. It's a little more pricey than what I like to pay for tools and services. It does serve a purpose though, but um, Glide sends out things like your um, your buyers and investigation election form, which like I said, it's like one page with like 72 different types of investigation. They've got to mark every box either yes or no, or it's not a valid form. So um, so I send that one out through Glide. And what Glide does is it, it will send an email to the buyer. The buyer opens that and they'll say, hey, are you interested in these three or four investigations? And yes or no, that, that, that they mark them. And then it goes next. And then it goes, are you interested in any of these? So it kind of breaks it down in a more palatable format so that the buyer makes sure they answer every question with either yes or no. And again, that buyer investigation or buyer inspection election, it's investigation elections form, the BIE, that form really is just like what potential investigations do you want to do on the property? It doesn't lock anybody into something, but then it allows you to have a conversation. If they say, hey, we wanted to have a easement uh, inspection, then you can say, hey, we can absolutely do that. Or when we get the preliminary title report, 
um, it will show you what easements are already re recorded on the property. So does that suffice for what you were looking for on that one? They're gonna be like, oh yeah, that absolutely works. But see, buyers don't know what's included and what's not included. So it just gives you that talking point. It allows you to share your knowledge, um, to come across as the expert and allows the buyers to make sure that they're getting all of their issues addressed. Okay. So I don't know if you noticed the first time I opened this file, there were no documents in here. I don't know why it's doing that. It's I've been having a problem with my listings lately with it doing that. Um, oh, anyways, I just backed out, clicked on like the dashboard, then went back to transactions, reopened it, and all my documents are there. Um, Michelle, on that glide to you access it through Barry. So if you go to your your Barry's logon, um, the homepage that has all your extra tools and everything on there. Glide is one of those options. So you can click on that and then create your login information. All right. So our listing forms for the listing transaction, your residential listing agreement. Okay. Now with that residential listing agreement, keep in mind, we have our agency disclosure, right? We have our, um, Fair housing, right? We can't discriminate. We have that disclosure that's on there. We have our possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. It sounds a lot like the purchase agreement, right? Um, same idea here. So you've got your agency disclosure. You've got your fair housing and discrimination advisory. You've got your possible representation of more than one buyer or seller disclosure and content, your wire fraud and electronic funds transfer advisory. You've got your broker compensation advisory. That's a new one that just came out in May. This is attached to both the listing agreement and the BRBC. So it's on the BRBC as well. Then we have our residential listing agreement. It's not quite as long as, oh, no, now it is quite as long as the, um, no, it's not. It's shorter now than the, the uh, purchase agreement. It's only six pages versus like 16. Um, we have our seller's advisory at the end of that document. And then we also have our California Consumer Privacy Act advisory. And that brings us to the end of the documents that are automatically attached to that listing agreement. So again, we can't take those away from the listing agreement. Every time that listing agreement is signed, those documents need to be attached to it and go with it. We don't have to find them individually because it's right there with the listing agreement. So they're automatically there. <clears throat> All right, so we have that listing agreement. So again, the goal there, we talked about the listing presentation. Our goal is to get that document signed at time of listing, okay? The other information that I like to send out with my listing agreement or right after it, if I got it signed in person, which again is the goal, is our disclosure information advisory, our DIA form. That form is probably my favorite disclosure in our entire car forms library. That outlines to the seller in really plain terms what's required of them as far as disclosure. Okay, what do they need to disclose about the property? What do they not? One of my favorite lines in there is if you're thinking if you're wondering if something needs to be disclosed, think about why you might not want to disclose that information and chances are you don't because you're afraid it might affect the sale, which means it needs to be disclosed, right? So it says like things like that in there. So like, stop hiding things. If you're wondering about it, disclose it. One of my favorite disclosures right there, disclosure information advisory, take some time to read it. In addition, that market conditions advisory gets signed not just by my buyers, but also signed by my sellers because on the seller side of things, it says, hey, the market's cyclical. There's ups and downs. There's different types of markets. And ultimately seller, you're responsible for what we put the house on the market for the what list price it goes on the market and what offer you choose to accept, right? So it's like, hey, your agent can make recommendations. They can tell you what they think, but ultimately the choice is yours. So don't come back in a year and say, I should have sold it for more and it's your fault. Nope, sorry, market conditions advisory was in there. I, I advised you on what I thought you should list it at, but ultimately it was your choice. Along with that, I like to send out the water conserving plumbing fixtures and carbon monoxide detector notice stating that the state of California has requirements that all new faucets are installed that are water conserving plumbing fixtures. And if they know of any faucets in their house that are not water conserving plumbing fixtures, they're required to disclose those as part of the SPQ or the TDS. I don't remember which one it's on. 
Um, keep in mind, you can't even order or buy non-water conserving plumbing fixtures in the state of California. You can't have them. You can't order them out of state and have them shipped to you. They will not ship them to the state of California. You either have to drive across the border to buy it, or you have to hire somebody or pay somebody or have a friend or family member. You ship it to their house. They drive it into the state for you. That's the only way to get them in. So chances are any faucets that have been replaced in the property, um, they're all water conserving plumbing fixtures because you just can't get your hands on them anymore in the state of California if they are not. The other half of that is the carbon monoxide detector notice stating that in fact, the law requires that there be a carbon monoxide detector in the property if it has an attached garage, gas appliances of any type, or a wood-burning fireplace. So those are the requirements. If it has one of those features, a carbon monoxide detector is required. It outlines that. Keep in mind, most people put those, they get a carbon monoxide smoke detector, they slap it on the ceiling. Um, carbon monoxide sinks, that really does you no good. But that fits the requirement up there on the ceiling, but it really should be like knee level or lower in your house. So in case you wanted to know for your own personal knowledge, it should be lower because carbon monoxide is heavy. Um, the requirement for the carbon monoxide detector is that there is one in the hallway leading to the bedrooms. Okay, just one requirement in the hallway leading to the bedrooms. If there's more than one level of house, even if all the bedrooms are on the second story, the first level also needs a carbon monoxide detector. So there should be one on each level and one leading to any of the bedroom areas. Um, so that's that water conserving plumbing fixture and carbon monoxide detector notice. The other one that I like to send out is the water heater and smoke detector statement of compliance. Um, this, these two disclosures, just so you know, they really bother me. Um, the original disclosure was just the water heater and smoke detector several years past. Then they released the carbon monoxide and water conserving plumbing fixtures. But I really feel like they should update it. So it's water conserving plumbing fixtures and water heater. And then carbon monoxide and smoke detector on the same one. But that's just me. I'm not in charge of these forms. Um, so here we are, we have water conserving plumbing fixtures with the carbon monoxide and we have water heater with the smoke detector. The water heater portion just says that, hey, it needs to be double strapped. Okay, so that's the California requirement for point of sale is a double strapping on the water heater. That's the first portion of it. The second portion is the smoke detector statement of compliance, just like the carbon monoxide detector. Smoke detectors are required as a point of sale. The smoke detectors um, are needed in the same locations and then some of the carbon monoxide. So they should be in the hallways leading to the bedroom areas. So right, one in each hallway leading to bedroom areas or one on each level. And one on each level, I guess, really would be better. So you should have a smoke detector on each level of the property and then also leading to any of the bedrooms. Um, if you had bedrooms on both levels, the carbon monoxide could be near the bedroom on both levels, along with the smoke detector. If there's only bedrooms on the one level, then it can go anywhere on the level without bedrooms. Okay. Um, so those are your smoke detectors. Your smoke detectors also, in addition to leading to the bedrooms and on each level, they need to be one in each bedroom. And Adriana had a really interesting home inspection the other day, which I've never seen before. The, the smoke detector technically can go anywhere in the bedroom, okay? There's no requirement, doesn't have to be over the door. There's no like state legality rules as to the location of that smoke detector. However, the home inspector that they hired to do the home inspection, the smoke detector was across the room from the doorway and the smoke, the home inspector made a note that the smoke detector was too far away from the doorway. I don't know why that applied. Um, he said it could be too dangerous, but in reality, the smoke detector in the bedroom is in case there's a fire inside the bedroom. Fires can be anywhere in that bedroom, not just near the doorways. The one in the hallway should have detected and started going off if there was smoke in the hallway. So anyways, just food for thought there. If your seller does not have a smoke detector in a bedroom, you may wanna have them put it near the doorway generally on the ceiling, because again, smoke floats, unlike that carbon monoxide, um, just so you don't have any random home inspectors saying that's in the wrong location, okay? There's my little side note for the day. I just thought that was the most random thing ever on the home inspection. 
So water heater smoke detector just says, hey, double strap, make sure you've got smoke detectors in place. The other one that I send out to my sellers at time of listing agreement would be our statewide buyer and seller advisory. Again, we talked about this with the buyer transaction. My sellers also sign it. It outlines how you can be represented in that transaction again. And it also talks about everybody's duties as it lies with that um, a transaction that my duty is to disclose any information, material information I have on the property or come across regarding the property and that the seller's responsibility is to do the same. It also makes the seller aware of all the different types of investigations a buyer can do on their property. So that statewide buyer and seller. The next one I do is the wildfire disaster advisory. That one actually doesn't get signed by a seller. It's just a buyer signature. I include it in all of my listing packages just so that when I upload all of my disclosures to disclosure, oh, home light listing management, which is where I put all my disclosures for the buyers to review prior to writing an offer, that Michelle, just so you know, we also have access to through Berries. So if you log into Berries, you look at the productivity tools that they have available to you. You'll also see home light listing management. Again, it's free for the way that I use it. And I upload all my seller disclosures there. And then I share the link to the MLS. Um, so I usually upload a blank wildfire disaster advisory because I want to make sure the buyer is aware that they need to do all this up front and that we are in an area where there's fire. <coughs> the other thing that I like to send out for my sellers is the square footage and lot size advisory. Okay, that one gets filled in with the square footage of the property. I usually fill it in for my sellers it's a good point to have a conversation with your sellers that the, hey, tax records indicate your property is this size and your house is this size. Does that sound accurate to you? Yep, that's accurate. Perfect. Then I just say, hey, I plug in the square footage and the lot size. I say per tax records and I attach a copy of the tax records to that disclosure. I have my seller sign it and then I upload it so the buyers can review. If my sellers are like, oh, no, no, the tax records are wrong. We actually did an update to the property. I don't know why it was permitted. It never reflected there, but it's actually 200 square feet larger than what's indicated. I would put what's in the tax records on the first line. The next line, I would say per seller, the square footage of the actual house is 1,800 square feet instead of 1,600 square feet. And then I would mark per seller on there and then have the seller sign that, right? So there's multiple lines that you can fill out other information. So if there's different information, we actually bought a house one time um, that I think three or four times throughout its, its lifetime, it was built in 64. Um, different square footage were listed on the in the MLS as previous sales. There was no rhyme or reason to it. Um, so I just put it in there and marked the box for MLS so that people could see that there's some discrepancy over the square footage of the property. So it just discloses that. Why is that important? Because some buyers may determine that square footage or lot size is a material fact. And if we said it's 1,600 square feet and it's actually 1,800 square feet, maybe they don't want a house that big or maybe they, who knows, maybe it said 18 and they wanted us, they came back, it was actually 16. This gives them the right to cancel. It outlines to the buyer that, hey, um, this is the information that we have on hand. We do not guarantee the accuracy of it. If this is a material issue for you, you should have somebody measure the house for you. Okay, so it just outlines that. So it takes the responsibility off me because I put it in the MLS at a certain square footage. It also takes the responsibility off the seller. So it puts it on the buyer side. If the property is not being um, put in the MLS right away, okay, it needs to be into Skyslope, which is our compliance software within 24 hours of signed listing agreement. It needs to go in the MLS, I believe it's within three days of signed listing agreement, okay, or within 24 hours of public marketing, unless we have otherwise indicated. So we would include this seller instructions to exclude listing from the multiple listing service if it's not going in the MLS and be marketed to the public right away. Okay. Um, Berries does allow us to market properties as coming soon. So we could get a listing agreement signed today, have it not go on market until you know 30 days from now, but we could actually be starting our coming soon marketing 
um, now talking to the office about it, sharing it with our clients, doing whatever we want with that listing, um, even though it's not in the MLS. That covers your Marin, Napa, Sonoma, Solano, Mendocino counties. Okay, outside of those five counties, most other MLSs are the primary MLS and most of them have that they uh, participate in the clear cooperation policy with the National Association of Realtors, which means that you can't market that property to the public without having it in the MLS and ready to be shown within 24 hours of the beginning of that. So what does that mean? You cannot put a sign in the yard that says for sale or coming soon before it's in the MLS or 20 up to 24 hours before you can put that sign in. You can't send out postcards. You can't make social media posts. Um, and we need to make sure we have this seller instruction to exclude listing from the multiple listing service signed, sealed and delivered at time of listing. Okay, so make sure you get that document signed. In addition to getting it signed, just so everybody knows, there's also a step in the Barry's MLS system, no matter which MLS it's going into, as long as it's co-opt with Barry's. So if it's an area that you can search inside of Barry's, um, you go on that front page when you log into Barry's. It has useful links as one of those boxes. It's the seller or listing exclusion form. You click on that, walk through the steps. It's super simple. You just plug in like the address, your information, when the property is going to go on the market or whatever. So super simple. They'll send you an email confirmation, attach that to your SELM form. Um, but you need that if you're not going to have it in the MLS um, within three days of signed listing agreement. Okay. Um, that's the end of what I send out to the seller. Oh, there's one other one. I apologize. Down here at the bottom, the Solano County Disclosure Update or it's Solano County Regional Disclosure and Disclaimer Advisory is the actual name. Most counties and some cities have a regional disclosure. Um, Solano has one, Yolo has one, Placer has one, I think Napa has one, I think Sacramento has one, right? So almost every county does. If you're like, Amy, how do I know? Just search, like, Cal search, um, you know, if it was like Sacramento, you go Sacramento um, real estate disclosure, Sacramento County real estate disclosure. And usually it'll pop up that way. This one this morning, I just searched Solano County uh, real estate disclosure, it pops up, Okay. You can always ask um, Melina in the office. She usually knows as well which counties or cities have specific ones. Um, I usually send that out at time of listing as well because technically it goes with the SBSA, that statewide buyer and seller advisory. The regional disclosure goes out with that one. So um, if you ever have questions about what the regional uh, requirements are because every area is different, and you're going to find it in that regional disclosure. So if something, there's another point of sale that's different than the water heater, water conserving plumbing fixtures, carbon monoxide or smoke detector, it's going to be in that regional disclosure. Like the city of Davis has a pre-sale inspection that needs to be done. So you can usually find that in their Yolo County disclosure. Um, a lot of the Bay Area cities have a sewer lateral inspection that's required to be done. Uh, Woodland has a fire suppression system inspection that has to be done as a point of sale requirement. So uh, uh, Placer County has a requirement for wood stoves, random stuff. Um, it's usually in that regional disclosure, so make sure you review it and read through it. Okay, so that's what goes out with my listing agreement. Then after the listing agreement goes out, usually within a week or so of going on market, I'm going to go back to Glide, create a seller transaction in there, and I'm going to send out the following disclosures in Glide to my sellers. <clears throat> the transfer disclosure statement, if they are an exempt seller, we can cover that on another date, then they would get the exempt seller disclosure or the ESD versus the TDS. I'm also going to send them out the seller property questionnaire or the SPQ. So SPQ TDS, um, the seller's affidavit of non-foreign status or the FIRPTA, F-I-R-P-T-A, FIRPTA. Um, that goes out one to each seller and it states that they're going to ultimately disclose their social security number and other things to the title company to make sure that they taxes are withheld because the state of California, 
I don't know why they've decided that it's the buyer's responsibility to make sure that taxes are withheld from the seller's proceeds if they're supposed to be withheld because of capital gains purposes or they're non foreign or they're a foreign person in uh, the nation or in California. Don't ask me. Okay, I don't know. But anyways, this FERPTA takes care of that. So the TDS, the SPQ, the FERPTA, I send out via Glide. In addition to those two, there are two additional disclosures. One is lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazards. That one goes out through Glide. Um, it's the LPD. And that just, if the property was built before 1978, you need this disclosure. And it just states that there could be lead-based paint. It asks the seller if they know of are aware of any paint in the home that is lead-based paint. The other one that goes out through Glide for me is the uh, earthquake hazards report. Okay, and that one, again, has questions for the seller. We only need this one if the house was built before 1965. So lead-based paint is 78. Earthquake hazards is 65. And this asks the seller questions about the house with regards to the structure of the house and earthquake safety. Okay, so... That lead-based paint, the LPD, um, the earthquake hazards report, the seller property questionnaire, the ASPQ, or the TDS, the transfer disclosure statement, as well as the FERPTA, I send out through Glide because all of those <clears throat> have questions on them that the seller actually needs to sign and answer the questions. Okay, and I like the way that Glide does it. It's way more user friendly. Again, it breaks it down in bite sized chunks and makes sure the seller doesn't miss anything. So, all of those I send out through Glide. Everything else I would just send out through AuthentiSign with the listing agreement or shortly thereafter. And that takes care of all the requirements for the seller disclosures. Okay, so that I've got everything done up front. The only thing that I do after we enter into contract would be my agent visual inspection disclosure or my AVID. And that one I also do through Glide because Glide allows me to just click on the buttons, fill in all the information I need to, add as many rooms as I need to. It allows me to add pictures to that agent visual inspection. So for both my buyer and my seller, I do the AVID at uh, through Glide. And you should do your AVID within 24 hours of accepted offer, okay? I would not do my AVID um, before the offer is accepted. Any questions about seller transactions and the documents that should be included? All right. Fabulous. Any questions before we wrap up today? We covered buyer transactions and seller transactions, kind of went through the list of forms. Um, yes, uh, Michelle, here in just a minute, I will read back, open up the buyer transaction list. Amy? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Hey, I just got into a contract on a property that has leased solar. I know there's uh -huh. a solar... Uh, advisory form. She does, she didn't have it on her disclosures. Do I need to ask for it now? Yes, ask for it. So uh, good point, Adriana. If the property has solar, right, there's so many little like caveats to a listing transaction, but uh, they are in contract on a property that has solar. Absolutely. There's a solar form. The acronym is actually solar, S-O-L-A-R. It discloses all the information the sellers have about that solar powered system. Um, so if it's not included as part of the disclosures, I would ask the listing agent to include um, that form. In addition, on listings, if it's a bank-owned property, there's an REO addendum or advisory, if it's a short sale, if it's bank-owned, right? So there's all these, if it's a mobile home or manufactured, there's a lot of different little caveats. So just kind of keep that in mind. There's little random things. If the seller was going to um, make it the sale contingent on purchasing replacement property, there's an SPRP form for that. If the... Um, Let's see, if the seller needs a rent back, there's a SIP form for up to 29 days, residential lease after sale for more than 30, right? So there's all these additional forms there. Um, thank you, 
for not uh, showing my forms again. So hold on, I'm just trying to pull up that list. Go ahead, Adriana. What's the name of the solar form? Do you remember? I believe it's solar. I believe if you search a uh, capital S O L A R, that should be the acronym. Okay. Thank you. It should come up though. If you search solar as well, if you want to look for the official name, um, because it's, let's see what the name is. Hold on. S O L A R. Solar advisory and questionnaire is the name of the form. Um, Michelle, here is that list of buyer forms if you wanted to screenshot it. And make sure you make suggestions if there's trainings that you would like to see coming up over the next couple of months or thanks everyone for joining me. Any other questions before we close out today? Thank Perfect. you. You are welcome. You are welcome. Have a fabulous day. We will see you tomorrow for seller contract to close. You are welcome, Michelle.